Well, that's um, Milt Hinton on his eponymous album, simply titled Milt Hinton, playing Milt to the Hilt. And, uh, I really love that guy's playing. Yeah, man. That's cool. a, even just the last note, see, on, on my bass, I play two gut strings like Charlie Hayden does. We play the, the G and the D string gut, and the A and the E, we still use uh, regular metal spiral core or tetrachord strings. But you hear on that last note he plays, he plays a low F, and it goes, bow, and that was a, that's a, that's a gut string on the bottom. It's a, it has a nice deep tone. It can be kind of very inexact on an amplifier. You put it through an amp, and you're just like, well, is that an F, or what is that wobbly note? Blah, 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 blah. You know, it sounds kind of weird. But um, it has a mysterious timbre to it. Mind you, people didn't play metal strings till 1970. And so far, every recording we've listened to is pre-Kenny Clark, pre-World War... At the end of World War II, Dizzy Gillespie had popularized Kenny Clark's ride cymbal pattern. Everybody still, in, on all these recordings we've listened to, is pre-war, pre-Kenny Clark. They're playing on the hi-hats. And that's where the, and the bass is driving all of it, right? Right. Yeah. Yeah, and also just uh, you just get such a well-rounded, complete kind of performance and player there. You know, just every note's perfect, tasty, right where it should be. Um, yeah, and you're starting to get those eighth notes are starting to sneak through, even though it was kind of a walking bass solo. Uh, there was some eighth note action happening, and it, it sounds very supple when he does it. It doesn't sound like he's uh, stressing about it. Mm -hmm. uh, very nice... Uh, a relaxed ability to play eighth notes at that quicker tempo. Um, and I really hear in the walking feel and in some of those eighth note fields, I really hear Mingus, one of Mingus's main influences. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Cool. All right, moving on. And this, this is going to, yeah, this is setting us up for, for my main man right here. This is the fountainhead. This is the fountainhead of modern acoustic bass playing, Jimmy Blanton. Now, Jimmy Blanton is a name that I was familiar with, um, but uh, didn't know, you know, a lot about. And uh, and so he's a Tennessee guy. Uh, again, we're seeing now this, you know, the spread throughout the country where these people are coming from. And like just about everybody on the list, he studied violin and then took a bass <laughs> when he was yeah. at when he was at Tennessee State University, you know, uh, going to college and uh, studying music there. Um, so he comes in with a really strong uh, musical uh, knowledge and, and background. And, uh, and so he joins Duke Ellington's band in 1939 and, and immediately becomes kind of a star. Huh? Yeah, he was a sensation. Duke and the band loved him. They, this was just like, he's playing all that stuff on the bass. And, of course, Duke Ellington, with his concerto of the individual concept, is going to take full advantage of this genius young man that he has on the bass here who's innovating the instrument. To, you know, he's innovating the instrument exactly the way Jocko did for the electric bass. It's exactly the same thing. It's what Charlie Parker did for the saxophone, you no. know, and what Coleman Hawkins did for the tenor saxophone. This is what Jimmy Blanton does for the bass. That's why he's the fountainhead of this thing. And, of course, Duke's going to take full advantage of, of this genius that he has on the bass and they do a duet record together that's awesome and then uh jimmy blanton webster ben webster band there's usually in a three record three cd uh box set at uh, the blanton webster years it's usually how it's packaged uh, it's been packaged many diff many times over and all the arrangements are Billy Strayhorn's first arrangements with Duke because he joined the band at the same time. So this is what a what a confluence of fantastic <laughs> right there. And there's some some of the most classic Duke Ellington recordings of all time are made with Blanton at, at the bass. Now, uh, mention tell, tell me a little bit about a Milton uh, Minton's Playhouse. This kind of comes up where. The, there was uh, Minton always kind of leading these kind of jam sessions, informal jam sessions, and said that he took right. he took uh, you know a part in some of those in New York, and that kind of helped him develop his style. Well, this is the this is the this is the think tank that becomes bebop. It's happening at Minton's. Now is this Min a, is this Monk, a club or is this a living room or what is Minton's Playhouse? It's 
It's almost like a leftover from the speakeasy era. It's an all-night jam session, jazz, uh, barbecue kind of place. Uh, I forget what Minton's other job was. Would would you give yeah. your your left playing arm uh, to to have been in that room and been able to sit in on some of those sessions? Are you kidding me? <laughs> Are you fucking kidding me? For and it went on for years. Yeah. So the music was really formed there. Um, the jam session was led by house pianist Thelonious Monk, who couldn't get a gig otherwise. <laughs> Uh, Monk got the gig with Coleman Hawkins because Coleman Hawkins would go there and sit in after his gig. Roy Eldridge would show up and sit in after his gig, so Dizzy Gillespie, who's a Roy Eldridge disciple, would go down there and cut cut with Roy on who could play higher. Monk taught Dizzy Gillespie the modern chord changes at Minton's. Fats Navarro's coming down there. Bird's going down there. It's the think tank that it all happened. Wow. This is where everybody was forming the music. It was like, because the, you would go do your show with Cab Calloway downtown, and then you'd go uptown, Harlem, and you'd play the real black music, not just showbiz music that's for, for whites. You'd go and play your, your uptown music in Harlem. And then everybody would go there uh, after hours. They'd play till 7 in the morning. Yeah. Now, one thing about Cab Calloway, you know, we talked about him uh, before we did the show, and and um, and you know, a super famous performer. But you reminded yeah. me that he was like a world famous performer, and and I realized that's because yeah. you know, film now could record these performances, and he was such a dynamic showman and everything. So not only is he playing, you know big venues and everybody in the bands are making their money so they can go hang out at Milton's Playhouse because they got the they got the <laughs> money from the the big paying gig but he's now getting that image uh and that band's getting broadcast all over the world now through film and uh and so I think uh you know when you're talking about the serious kind of music guys it's always Ellington and Basie but but Cab Calloway is is uh, really important too because it's where these guys could make a living and get recognition and and have a steady gig, you know. It's also exporting the music and exporting black music in a time of you know segregated radio and uh, uh, yeah. segregated uh, record companies, you know, mm -hmm. race records, and it's also you know Louis Armstrong is since he's kind of a saint and the music comes through him like a. It's like a spiritual, you know, Gabriel's trumpet, you know, something gentle and fantastic about Louis Armstrong. So he's uh, the face of a whole people to humanize them, to endear them to a world that is uh, unaccepting of them and their humanity. And Duke Ellington's doing that <clears throat> with the concerto for all these African-American guys, you know, and showing a sophisticated writing and... You know, it's not just like not just rhythmically dynamic. It's there's a lot of other uh, intelligent elements to it. You know, Duke Ellington presents himself as a duke, and he's sophisticated, and everybody's wearing tuxedos, and he speaks in kind of the Queen's English when he talks, and you know, it's the, for the advancement of the people. You know, then you're going to have <clears throat> someone like uh, Cab Calloway go up there, and it's like it's it's fun, it's funny. You know, he's a, he's he's hilarious. I mean, it gets old and kind of beat up after a while. So, you know, hi dee hi dee hi dee ho over and over again for right. your whole life. But but it was a, an important chapter in, uh, in uh, African-American yeah. music and culture. Yeah. Um, so, so we've got Jimmy Blanton, this very young kid, joins the band at age 21, Duke Ellington's band. And he's got these pizzicato and arco techniques, and he's just revolutionizing the instrument. And then he dies at age 23. <laughs> I mean, the music, blues and jazz, has its share of tragedy. It just seems to go along with it. You know, Bird dying at 35 and just Jocko dying at 36 or whatever. You know, just the music just has that. And Jimi Hendrix, the 29 Club. But I, I got to say, Jimmy Blanton's is one of the saddest ones of them all. You know? Oh, He's, just tragic. He dies at 23. From tuberculosis, uh, 
you know, the band had to abandon him. The Ugh. band loved him. Mm. Ben Webster, as much as he's a brute, he's also a big crybaby, bawling his eyes out over his main his main buddy, Jimmy, you know? It, it, Pure you, tragedy. Did you say the story that, that big uh, Ben Webster would carry his bass for him and stuff? I mean, yeah, yeah, through the snow to make the jam session. They, they were so enthusiastic about their new thing that they just had to go wherever mm-hmm. they were, whatever the circumstances. We're getting to that club and we're going to kick your ass and show you how to play music, motherfuckers. Yeah. And then <laughs> so he, he dies in 1942 in a, sanita- in a sanitarium in Duarte, California. It's such a tragic, you know... Frustrating. I know, getting abandoned out in the desert out there. Oh, man. Okay, but we have... But we're going to celebrate his awesomeness. So what what really separates him, what makes him the fountainhead, is that his eighth notes on quicker tempos are like a horn player. It's got all the chromatic embellishment, all the diatonic kind of, you know, uh, sophistication. It never sounds like it's struggling to to make it happen. It just kind of flows out nice and natural and vocal. And it just sets up the the gold standard of what bass playing is going to be forevermore after this. And that's Jimmy Blanton, man. Well, here's, you know, Duke Ellington with the Blanton Webster Band. And uh, I I picked a tune called Pitter Panther Patter, uh, because I thought it was a great uh, title. But also, uh, (laughs) hopefully this will show off some of the... Amazing uh, things you're talking about here. Let's listen to it. <laughs> 